Richard Norton, thanks for joining me on The Art of Action. How are you? I'm very well, thank you, Scott. It's, uh, I'm thrilled to, to be doing this with you. I mean, I, I admire you greatly, my friend, because you know, even though I know you've been at it a long time, but not probably as long as I have, and I love to see people that are carrying the torch, you know, forward with the, the action genre and taking it to places that we never got to take it in the 80s and 90s, so it's great. Oh. Well, do, doing my part, trying my best, you know, they keep giving me less and less time, so you know what that equates to most of the time. But anyway, it's a pleasure to talk to you because we've never met, we're meeting for the first time. No, you know what? And I was, I was thinking, I, uh, I was doing it. Uh, first time I sort of came across you, I was doing second unit directing and stunt coordinating on this Warner Brothers show. And I'm in Lithuania and I had a bunch of stunt guys, you know, Lithu half Lithuanian, half Russian. Anyway, one of them, Vladik, his name was, ended up going and doing a show with you. And he was an amazingly good physical specimen, you know, a good martial artist. But I remember him coming back and I said, how did it go? He said, he said, I can't believe it. Cause he's, he, he was pretty confident in his own abilities. This is the, the guy that I fight at the end of special forces for people. Listening. He was blown away with how fast you were. I think, I think he thought he was going to go there and be very impressive himself. And he came away very impressed with you. So that's, that's when I first got an inkling of you being around my friend. Well, why I wanted to talk to you, Richard, um, apart from the fact that I greatly respect you and I've seen you in many, many movies and many Hong Kong movies, many films with Cynthia Rothrock back in the day in the 90s. I remember watching all those. But you've got extensive experience in the Hong Kong film industry. And that's what I'd like to mostly talk about today, because that's, you know, that old school stuff really just, I revere it. And I still watch it to this day, just like, wow, this was the golden era of martial arts filmmaking. So I definitely want to talk in depth about that, but I know you've had a, uh, a huge career. You've done many films. Uh, you've been a fight coordinator on big Hollywood productions. I know like Mad Max and uh, I know you did some stuff. Was it on um, the Superman movie, the Justice League film that never happened? Is that right? With George yes, we, we did three months of that. Um, that was when uh, Dr. George, who for those who don't know, directed Mad Max, he was about to do the Justice League movie. We had actors there. We started training them. And suddenly it all went away, as, as so yeah. often these productions do. So I almost got to do Justice League, but not quite. So you were choreographing fights for Superman and Batman and all the rest of it? Yes, it was a great cast. And Army Hammer was, I think, playing Batman in that one. Megan Gale was going to, who was a, you know, very... Uh, famous like supermodel here in Australia was going to play Wonder Woman. Yeah, I mean, it, it, was a, it was an interesting start and it all sounded all very good, but you know, the reasons why these things fall apart are out of my, yeah. out of my scope and out of my hands, but yeah. But the last one I just did actually fight coordinating was uh, Suicide Squad with James Gunn. We did seven months in Atlanta. We did a month in um, Panama city and that that was fantastic i mean i really really enjoyed that experience we only got back to australia early march just got in before you know the shit hit the fan as it were and everything went down to lockdown but i really very much enjoyed that experience on suicide squad so yeah it's not it's nice to still be working scott you know because the older you get you know the less roles there are for obvious reasons yeah but i'm okay with that because luckily i learned a lot behind the camera and and as long as i'm still in the industry and still working and it still involves martial arts then i'm a happy man well what is your martial arts background then just briefly because I'm, I'm sure it's a lot but just so people understand uh, how you got into martial arts what you did and how that led to getting into the film business yeah well uh my first uh, martial arts foray was with judo and i was 11 years of age i started judo at 10 so similar oh did you <laughs> okay yeah. Probably the reason was judo was because there was a kid uh, moved into a house opposite to where I lived in Croydon, which is a suburb of Melbourne. And he was disappearing two nights a week. And I remember saying, hey, Morris, where are you going? You know, and he said, oh, I'm going to judo classes. And I was immediately like, oh, my God, I want to go. <clears throat> so his dad would drive us to these classes. And, um, and, and 
considering, of course, that judo was probably the only martial art that we are aware of, because I'm talking about 1961, you know, when I was 11. So judo was one of the few arts. I think there were some karate schools, but I certainly didn't know about them. And I've often said, I was, even my introduction to judo was on the back of comic books, you know, defeat five attackers with, you know, one finger and all this sort of stuff. Yeah. Of course, I, I, I found out that was farcical because I was so skinny and little as an 11 year old, I was like cannon fodder for all the older teenage sort of uh, judo players, you know, brown butts and everything. They used to chuck me yeah. from one end of the dojo to the other, but there you go. And then it was a few years later that a friend that I went to judo and high school with said there was a karate school opening up. So that was Goju, Goju Kai. Goju Kai meaning was more the, uh, you know, Japanese version on the Gogen Yamaguchi as opposed to Okinawan. And uh, so I started that, loved that, and moved to the States in 1979, started training with Chuck Norris every morning. And, right. uh, you know, that was through my partner and I bringing Chuck out to Australia in 1978, and we formed a good friendship. Chuck then introduced me to so many amazing people. I started training with Benny the Jet Urquidez in yeah. late, uh, probably early 80s. And, uh, and that was before the Jet Center even existed. So I did a lot of kickboxing. Pete Cunningham, who was a Canadian, born in Trinidad, he became my coach for the last 30 years. Amazing, sugar, amazing. Sugar the foot Cunningham, right? Yeah, that's him. He was like the Sugar Ray Leonard of kickboxing. Yeah. So I, I trained with Petey and now, so I added that to the repertoire in the last, um, well, God, it's been over 30 years now. I've been also uh, heavily involved in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Mm. So uh, it's, been a, it's been a journey and it, it's still going on. Lifelong martial artist. Love it. So did you get into the film industry through your relationship with Chuck Norris or how, how did it happen? I had a partner, Bob Jones and I, who uh, started a style in 1970 we called Zendo Kai. And one of their students got involved in stunt work. And through whatever reason I even forget now, he wanted me to ask me if I was interested in doubling an actor in a movie called Last of the Knucklemen. And it was an Aussie movie. It was shot in Outback Australia, so I ended up doubling this actor and doing a fight scene with a WWF at the time, now WWE wrestler. So that was my intro. Uh, it was after that that Bob brought Chuck Norris out to Australia. And as I said, I was doing demonstrations on the same card. I was demonstrating Okinawan weapons and whatever. And Chuck was demonstrating. And he was also promoting Good Guys Wear Black, one of these very early movies. Yeah. So we just got on so, so well. And he said, look, Rich, if you ever get to California, give me a call and uh, we can do some training, which was an amazing invitation. And it's in 79 that I went to California to work full time with a rock and roller named Linda Ronstad. And a lot of the younger ones would know Linda, but Linda was as big as Beyonce in her day. She said, right. country West and all that. She wanted me to go and work for her full time as a personal bodyguard because I'd been doing bodyguard work since 73, starting with the Rolling Stones, Joe Cocker, Fleetwood Mac, worked with David Bowie for eight years and ended up working with Linda and James Taylor for 14 years. Anyway, when I got to California, the first person I called was Chuck and went to his house, started training every morning with him. And he was in the very early pre-production stages for the Octagon one of his very early ninja themed movies. Yeah. And he knew I could handle weapons. So he asked me if I would play his nemesis in the movie, which was a character called Keo, who, you know, I had a crimson mask, my face was covered. The reason being that technically I was supposed to be Asian. So this is that you was, in the uh, in the costume here. Yeah, that was me in the costume. 
This was the first thing you did apart from the, the doubling. That was it. That was the start of the whole career with uh, Chuck. He, he gave me the opportunity. And, and up until then, uh, I had no aspirations of doing movies. You know, I was there. I was loving training the martial arts. And I was, of course, doing the bodyguard work. And it was just, it's something that just happened along. And I remember thinking, wow, how good is this? I mean, I, I met Tadashi, you know, Yamashita on the set. I had Chuck, I had Simon and Philip Ree were working on this movie, Gerald Okamura. There was a whole slew of great martial artists. And I thought, this is not a bad way to make a living. You know, I can get paid and still be using martial arts. So that, that, started, that started a whole different sort of career path for me. And where did your weapons training come from? From, from the karate? Yeah, from karate, because my, my original instructor was Hawaiian Filipino. Tino Seberano was his name, and he had a, um, a partner, you know, that came out a little later from Hawaii called Sal Ebenez. And Sal was the first one I saw using Sai. And I went, wow, what, what is that? I, I was fascinated with the, with the weapon. And he was also, Tino would introduce us to Bo, you know, the long staff and everything. So I, I just developed a bit of an interest in, the, uh, in those Okinawan weapons. Is it true that the origin of these Okinawan weapons were from farmers? They would use it to, to farm. Is that true that the Sai was to pick up bales of hay and the nunchucks were to flail the hay and things like that? Have I got that completely wrong? No, no, that's correct. I mean, even the Sai, as you know, it it's, looks like a pitchfork. Yeah, you know, as you say, for hay and everything, and as you know, um, you know the Japanese invaders sort of banned different weapons as as they knew it. So that was how the locals or the farmers and everything started to adapt to farm implements as weapons of self defense. So the bow, of course, is just a wooden long staff, and sai is what it was. Sai used to be wooden, of course, you know, it turned into being a metal weapon. Um, and it was really as a side because of the way it was shaped was actually a quite a good defensive weapon against the katana, you know, the Japanese longsword. Yeah, I've seen you use the side quite a bit in, in your movies. You know why I enjoyed it, Scott, is because, you know, a lot of people, especially, since, you know, after Bruce Lee were playing around with nunchaku. To me, it became a little bit of a gimmick. It's not I'm in the hands of, a, of, of an expert, don't get me wrong, but there were a lot of kids playing... So I, I was attracted to Sai because I immediately thought, well, I can't carry it around with me. There's nothing else I can do with it except use it as an extension of my empty hand art, you know? Yeah. And so it became a very personal thing for me to just practice kata and practice forms and everything with the Sai, almost as a meditative type thing, you know? Jim Kata was an early movie for you. That was after the Octagon, was it? Yeah, well, yeah, that was, uh, I think, in 1984. And um, that was with Kurt Thomas, um, who was an Olympic gymnast. He was slated to win all sorts of gold before the U.S. boycotted the Russian Olympics. As you know, and for those who don't know, was directed by Bob Klaus, who directed Into the Dragon. I didn't know that. Dragon, did not know that. produced by Freddie Weintraub, who produced Into the Dragon. So that was, uh, that was a great um, opportunity for me to play um, Zemir, you know, this... this feudal sort of baddie and it was great when, and I was very sad to hear I mean this is just a little bit of info that Kurt passed away just a couple of weeks ago yeah he, I, I saw that yeah that's uh, what, I remember that movie what, what, being something that I would watch a lot uh, as, as a kid interesting you know idea for a movie Jim Catter that's very Fred Weintraub you know Freddie Freddie's idea with that was to basically create an American Jackie Chan in using Kurt Thomas because he's a gymnast. The problem was, bless Kurt's heart, is he, you know, you, you would know having worked there, that Scott, that these, these the Hong Kong studies, they can do their stuff on any surface, anywhere, under any conditions. Yeah. For Kurt, it had to be almost perfect conditions. So it's kind of funny when you look at the courtyard and you'll see it contraption is used for tying up goats or horses and it's it's obviously a pommel horse the ground yeah. is very flat so everything had to be, almost be like a gymnasium you know and because that's the only way Kurt could really do his gymnastics he just wasn't used to doing it 
not on a matted area and everything, but but it was it's pretty funny. I, I you know I had a fantastic experience. We shot in what was then Yugoslavia, and uh, I you know listen got to ride horses all around the countryside and see a new part of the world. So it was uh, it was a good memory for me. Oh, that's the best part about the job, right? Is all these places you get to go to. I mean, one minute you're at home and then the next thing you know you got a phone call and they say oh we're going to do a movie in whatever country and before you know it you're over there making it it's crazy business isn't it but a lot of hotel rooms as well four walls and a ceiling <laughs> so always a downside scott if you want to find it <laughs>
So that wouldn't have been cheap, yeah. but it was just an interesting process. So all I could do was really imitate whatever Samo in this case wanted me to do and then do it as many times as it took to get a, a take that he was happy with, which could be 30 takes or it could be 10, you know, it just varied. The contact was almost full contact. I mean, I've got footage of him side kicking me up against this wall and he must have done it 20 times. Why yeah. Terenzi? What was wrong with take one, two, three, four, five? Not hard enough. Even right. though you might have got it in the first one, two, three or four, or five, it was just an amazing process and it was exhausting. I, you know, and I, back then I was probably, I reckon I weighed 175 pounds, you know, I was a lot lighter than I am now. And I lost 16 pounds in weight over two and a half weeks doing that because we're inside, no air conditioning and just fighting the whole time. So uh, it's yeah, very it stressful, isn't it? Doing a Hong Kong movie, it's, there's so much expectation and it's, they're very hard men. And there's never a pat on the back. From my experience, never a pat on the back. Oh, you're doing well. Are you okay? Do you need anything? It's like, this is what it is. Do it. And, and we do it until you get it right. And even when you get it right, it's like, okay, next. It's not much of a, oh, well done. That was great. It's tough, isn't it? We, we'd like a little pat on the back every now and again, well, wouldn't we? A bit nice. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, in a, and once, you know what, in, in this Shoji Karata, he was a Japanese gentleman, it was famous for, in Hong Kong, he did something like 30, 40 movies there. He was such a gentleman. And I ended up, he ended up doing a fight scene later in the movie when I was fighting uh, Samo. He uh, fought Jackie. And he saw me getting very frustrated. This is very early on in the fights when we started to fight stuff. And he, I remember him saying to me, he said, Richard, he said, if you want to work in these movies, he said, just, mm don't say anything. He said, they don't care what you want to do. They literally believe they're God's gift to martial arts. It's their set and it's their movie. And you know what? I just took that advice. I thought, you know what? I'm just going to do it as many times as I want. I'm not going to complain or, or whatever. And that's kind of the tack I took. And it paid off in a way. That's, well, that's why I got to do quite a few movies in Hong Kong. It certainly wasn't because I had any better abilities than anyone else around in the day. I think it was literally because I would shut up, I would do what they wanted to do. I fortunately had the timing that worked for Jackie and Samo, which wasn't by design. It just happened to be that way through whatever course of training I'd had over the years. So everything just worked for them. And they just knew that I understood how they made movies. I, you know, because Jackie even said he got a little tired of, Westerners coming in either trying to show him how tough they were or wanting to do everything they wanted to do. And he said, that's not the way we work. So I think that was very instrumental in me getting future work in Hong Kong, you know, but like you said, mate, I, I know, I know no tougher film schedule than what it was like back then with the hours, with the contact, with yeah. learning choreography in front of camera and not getting a chance to rehearse, but there you go. You're working with Sammo Hung and he's the star, the director. Um, and like when, when he decides that he's going to smash himself through this, this glass, I mean, you know, what were you thinking? <laughs> well, you know, it, it, it's, it's crazy. I mean, the guy, I've always said, and I still mean it, that Sammo Hung is the most amazing action director, choreographer I've ever worked with. But you have a look at him and Jackie, Jackie even said to me, and by the way, for people that understand, you know, um, like Asian respect and everything, Jackie said to me, he said, Samo looks like an elephant, but moves like a monkey. And it was a total, total compliment because you'll see coming up, not that there, but there was a scene where I had to th swing a chair at Samo's legs. And I don't know what order we did it in, and he said, okay, I'm going to jump off this table and do a half flip and land on my feet. And I, I literally looked around behind him and I'm looking for the stunt double because I'm thinking there's no way this guy's going to be able to do that. But sure enough, what, 15, 20 times he did it and he did it perfectly. Here it is here. This move here, I mean, that's Samo 
And I'm like, my God. And that just immediately gave me an incredible respect for the gentleman. And he can also punch and kick really damn hard. You would know when you fight somebody in a movie, you get a feeling of whether they're just good at the choreography or whether they've really got power. But Samo can punch like a mule and he's got an amazing spinning back kick. And uh, it's oh, incredible. Yeah. This shot you're looking at here, I mean, yeah. he, he, we did that probably 30 times where he hit me with bare-fisted uppercut because they wanted to see my face contorting in slow motion. And I found a little bit of cotton wool to put in my teeth because I didn't want to chip my teeth. And there you go. You have to put your face in front of camera and get whacked by the great Sammo Hong. So. so how many times did they punch you in the face? I forget exactly, but it's over 20 times. This was your first one and you came back and did many more. What is wrong with you? You know what? It, it, I, um, I've got to tell you, I, I, I really was in good shape back then. <laughs> Not now, but back then I trained really hard. I did a lot of contact training. So the idea of contact didn't really concern me. You know, I, I, I almost enjoyed it. So I was okay. And, and that it was another reason why Semi liked me because I could see that he could kick me as hard as he wanted or whatever, and I'd be okay with it, you know? I completely ripped you off in a movie that I made called Accident Man because uh, your, I mean, your catchphrase became painful, right? Painful? I had my character say, painful. Painful. So a little homage uh, to you there, Richard. Don't know whether you knew that or not. No, I didn't. Where's my residual check? Um, it's huh? in the post. Have you not got it yet? <laughs> <laughs> it came about too because, as you know, you know all those films back then were dubbed. Nobody actually heard ever heard Jackie's real voice. It was a team that were going in dub, and they just asked me to just say something in English was kind of the length that they figured the Cantonese or Mandarin sort of dubbing would be. And I, I think I'm almost certain that was a, again a line that came from the great Sammo Hong. And it mm. did become a catchphrase. I used that a number of times. Painful. <laughs> no, I'll be okay. <clears throat> yeah, but Samo, when he when I say painful, I say you've got to be hurt now. And he yeah. got no. He basically says I can't feel anything because my body's all numb. <laughs> <laughs> That's good stuff. Doesn't hurt at all. My whole damn body is numb. Ow. <laughs> and what really makes me laugh is when he puts the blood on your fist and you go, "You son of a bitch!" And then you get punched. <laughs> That's a very funny moment. Again? Uh, you son of a... I don't remember if I watched China O'Brien first, but there was a video that came out in England and it was called The Best of Martial Arts Films and it's basically like they'd got the rights to a bunch of Golden Harvest movies and they just right. put a collection of fight sequences together. And I would watch it over and over and over again. And I think this might be the first time I ever saw you in this fight scene here. That's Karate, he's the one that gave me the advice about working in Hong Kong, you know, and lovely, lovely man and so talented. We went to Thailand to do some of this shoot. Oh, really? And, uh, he, you know, he's incredible. But I don't know whether you saw that, that leap that he just did, that was actually a double. And that was also when I found out about the Peking Opera School because the gentleman that did that came from that. And they told me, this is funny little stories. I mean, they're little tidbits that they said that he, he was trained in things like that. He'd have to do a handstand on a board that long that's on a roller like this. And he said, literally, he was expected to be able to stay in a handstand balancing this board for up to an hour. And every time he fell off earlier than that, he was literally beaten. And he said it was literally a case of beating no out of them. So you got certain stunt people like him that no wasn't in their vocabulary. Yeah. And uh, again, it was just a very enlightening time for me finding out about, you know, how they worked in Hong Kong. And I had been in, in uh, the Philippines doing a movie, did a lead in a small action movie. And unbeknownst to me, I developed a staph infection. And so oh. I go to Hong Kong. And in the three weeks before we started these fights, my legs started to swell up. And you can see I'm in cavalry boots. I mean, go figure, I right? had an Australian in US cavalry outfit in 
Asia. But there you go. And I kicked him and my knee had swollen up so big. And I remember thinking, I said, oh God, I can't tell Sam I can't do this because I've been here three weeks. The first kick I threw, Kalata blocked with his forearms and I literally, I nearly passed out. And I'm on the ground and they pulled my boot off and my boot was full of pus and blood because of the infection. So I had to go to hospital, have that lanced out. They quickly stitch me up and when you're back on set and away you go again. Oh, yeah, the train doesn't <laughs> stop rolling. It's left the station. The film's not going to wait for you. You've just got to get back there. I know because, you know, being, and, you know I, would, I realized that I would complain about the hours and work and I thought, shut up, Norton. They're doing this month after month, year in, year out, sometimes two movies at a time. So I sort of thought, don't stop complaining, you big baby. You know, how do you want to be in their shoes? One of the stunties that do these movies the whole time. And it was a ridiculous work rate that they had. You've always been able to deliver a line convincingly and one of the better actors, I would say. Now, why is this? Did you have any acting training or are you just a natural? <laughs> just happens. To... You can't <laughs> teach that shit, mate. <laughs> No, you know what? I did do acting training. I did a lot of acting classes in LA because, and that, that came about from Octagon because, you know, I played Keo with the main sort of baddie, but I also played a character called Long Legs, which is pretty funny because my height's in my upper body and my legs are quite short. But anyway, I, I played this character. And, and so the first line I had as this terrorist in this training camp that Chuck turns up in, I had to say, sit down. So in my head, I'm going, oh shit, this is Academy Award time. You know what I mean? It just is easy. And I remember getting up there and suddenly it occurred to me, there's like 10 different ways I could say, sit down, sit down, yeah. sit down, sit down. <laughs> yeah. And I, I sort of went, oh, there's a lot more to this than meets the eye. And that prompted me. And actually it was a, an acting coach that Chuck was going to called Zena Provendy. She used to be MGM's chief acting coach. So I spent quite a few years with her, just trying to at least get my head around drama and all of that. And, and listen, I'm, I'm mediocre at best. And that's okay with me because I realized later on, looking back at my career, that I obviously didn't love acting enough or as much as I loved martial arts. Otherwise, I would have spent as much time in an acting class as I did in a martial arts school. So the first time you worked with Cynthia was um, Millionaire's Express, Shanghai Express. And was this the second time? Yeah, so this, um, listen, again, I'll tell you a little, see that costume I'm wearing, the, the yeah. suit? We were shooting, we went to Taiwan to do a certain amount and we shot in a studio in Hong Kong for some of it. It was, it was I've never been in such a hot environment and they only had one suit so every time I'd sort of get sweaty and everything after 10 minutes, they'd take it off and iron it dry and I'd put it back on again. How's that? <laughs> I bet uh, it stank. No, no. <laughs> Come on. It's fine. But, well. but, uh, it, but, but again, you know, I'm supposed to be this Russian guy who knows all these different martial arts, which is pretty funny. Had you done Kung Fu? Did, did you know all this Kung Fu stuff that you're doing? It looks pretty no. convincing. Thank you. Yeah. Again, it's just copying what they gave me to do. Listen, I think what helped me even with that is Goju, Goju Ru, you know, or Goju Kai, you know, it's a particular brand of karate, you know, Go means hard, Ju means soft, a hard, soft style. So it was a lot of linear type motion, but also a lot of circular type of motion. So it was very, it had a very much, a, obviously, they all did a Chinese influence. White Crane Kung Fu was where Goju originally came from. So I think having trained in Goju helped me to, able, uh, to be able to adapt to a lot of the moves that they wanted me to do in a film like Magic Crystal. You know, a funny story too, Cynthia, I had to punch Cynthia. And again, as you know, there's still contact even with the sigh. That one that she just dropped to their knees on, yeah. I was supposed to hit her like I'm hitting Andy, like in the ribs. So Cynthia suddenly says to me, well, now are you gonna hit exactly, you know, here? with the sigh, you know, with the end of the sigh, the pommel end. I said, well, sort of, why? So she'd taken this pad that was on here and cut it 
down to like the size of a postage stamp because she didn't want it to make her look bulk out. And, <laughs> put it to where I'm, and I said, oh, my God. I said, well, maybe I'll hit that and maybe not. I said, I don't know. <laughs> we often laugh about that. I thought that was very funny. Crazy death scene here, Richard. Oh, I forget how I die. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> we we still laugh it, it, when we first saw the alien that this is all about you know this thing i mean we were like oh my god you can't be serious it looked like it looked like a two-year-old and make a little paper mache sort of thing you know it was like a crumpled thing with a couple of eyes and a mouth we still laugh to this day. It reminds me of a death scene that I had in the second uh, Hong Kong movie that I did, Black Mass 2. And I'm playing this guy who's got the powers of an electric eel. And I go to punch the star Black Mask and he moves. And because I'm electric, I, I melt into the back of this statue. And then the last shot of me after I've died is basically me hanging out the back of this statue's ass. <laughs> <laughs> That was an interesting one. I think that's <laughs> a little that deserves more attention than my death that you just played. It's all about the death scene. Beat that one. Well, Cynthia Rothrock, I've always been a huge fan of her. I mean, I can't think of another female martial arts film actor that, that, that moves like she does. I mean, she's absolutely phenomenal. Yeah, well, she was a world forms champion for a number of years. Um, when I first met Cynthia uh, in the States, you know, her, I trained with her and her boyfriend, George Chung. George Chung was also a world forms champion. And when you look at what they did back in those days, it was just, just such par excellence, you know, with, with the way they would kick and their technique and everything else. So she was very skilled. She could place a kick exactly where you wanted it to go. She was very strong, very powerful you know, with, with a technique. Powerful. And you're right, I don't know anybody else that's come yeah. close to, to her, you know. You don't get many girls that can kick with the power that she kicks with. You know what right. I mean? That's force. You can see the speed and the power behind the way she does it. So how did China O'Brien come about? That again came about through Freddie. Is because Robert Klaus, Klaus, is, is this Robert Klaus yeah. directing China O'Brien? Robert Klaus, again, director of Into the Dragon, and Fred Weintraub produced it. And that was that was fun. That was, you know, that, again, as you know, um, Scott, there's, there's not much money to play with, you know, they're low budget movies, but they suited, you know, the, the sort of style of action movies or martial art action movies for back then. And yeah. I got to tell you, you know, having worked on some really, really big movies more as a fight corner owner, I just, I look back and I love the experience of working on those lower budget movies because you know, I have a saying that, you know, how you get treated on the big budgets sort of is depends on where your name appears on a call sheet. But with those lower budget movies, it's like everybody just kicks in and does whatever they need to do to get the job done. And it was just a far more collaborative sort of process that I enjoyed. Was it just a night of doing this or maybe oh, yeah. two? Yeah. No, no, just a night. You know, you just put it together and you got it done, which, which you know, which you could do, because I, that's all I really knew how to do was just quickly, you know, figure out the choreography and then get it over with. Because that was, as you know, again, it was a very typical Western movie. They would put their time into the so-called drama and very little time into the action. You know, the difference being in Hong Kong, Jackie, you know, way back said, he said, people don't want to see me talking. They don't want to see drama. They're interested in the fight scenes. So they would just put all the emphasis on the fight. Nice to have both. Yeah, no, absolutely. But it was just very typical of a, of a Western movie to just not put the amount of time necessary to really make a good fight scene. I mean, that's the reason that the Hong Kong movies fights look so good is, again, because they prioritize them on the schedule and they'll do it until it's, it's, it's correct. I mean, even Bob Klaus, you know, when he did Into the Dragon, he, he, it was a funny story when he was shooting with Bruce that they did a particular day shooting and they went in to watch uh, some of the takes at night. And Bob said he was sitting there next to Bruce and Bruce said, oh, we, you know, basically we're gonna go back in again tomorrow and we're gonna reshoot this. 
And Bob used to doing, and again, End of the Dragon was a Western movie, you know, it was a Warner Brothers movie and not having as much time or budget. He, he said, he said, no, 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 we don't have time to reshoot it. He said, Bruce reached across, grabbed him by the throat like this. Yeah. And basically they went back the next day and they reshot <laughs> what they wanted. That's amazing. Yeah, I know. It grabbed him by the throat. And it was like, don't oh. Blame, don't blame Bruce one little bit. He made the right decision grabbing his throat. <laughs> well, but see, that, you know, I mean, that's the question. So I'd love to hear if you know anything more about the shooting events of the Dragon, because obviously you look at Bruce Lee's films and they're all shot in a different way. Enter the Dragon has that very specific American style of he's in the center of the frame and all the guys in the cave are running in from angles. And sometimes he's hitting one guy who's out of shot and then he falls through the frame. And, yeah. you know, it's very different to his other movies, but it works incredibly well. And I don't know if it's just by accident or not. I think it's, you know, as you know, it's very hard when you shoot a fight scene with multiple opponents because the problem is if you pull back wide, you need to, you get to see what all of them are doing while they're waiting for their turn to go in and kind of get smacked, you know? And that was, that was, I noticed even to a certain degree in Hong Kong, they do that a bit though, not to the same degree, but what you said, they would have your main star like Bruce and they would just feed people in. And when you did cut away to a wide shot, what they would do is basically people would stay up, but they would run side to side. And the illusion was that they were all very actively involved in the foot, but they wouldn't move forward until it was their time to run in and get kicked or punched, you know? So hence you'd see a lot of Bruce in the middle and just feed people in and bang, out they'd go, you do a cut of where somebody landed or whatever. So it became quite an efficient way of shooting for instance, in Enter the Dragon, when again, you didn't have time to justify well, what are eight people doing whilst Bruce is fighting this one person, if that makes sense. But there's very, they're very long takes, aren't they? And all from the same sort of angle, but there's, uh, there's no misses in there. He always looks like he hits. I mean, okay, some guys are off screen, but then there's guys that are on screen. And I mean, he's just the best, yeah. isn't he, Bruce? It's incredible. So he would go back yeah. and reshoot it if he wasn't happy with it, that's why. Yeah. Well, yeah, I don't know how much, but I remember Bob uh, Bob telling me that story. And then, oh, man, that's pretty funny. At least that's he can great. say he actually got grabbed by the throat by the legendary Bruce Lee. Say, may I? It was, one of, it was a movie that was actually meant to appeal probably to a younger audience than Jackie would normally appeal to. It was a little more comedic than a lot of others. Even he said it was a bit of a risk for him to do. The main fight that I did with Jackie in City Hunter took six and a half weeks. We, we used to just shoot whole movies in six and a half weeks. And it was long. I mean, it was, I think, nine minutes in length when you got through it all. And of course, they're doing other bits and pieces all over the shop while we're doing it. But yeah, it was, uh, that was an incredibly long fight scene. But you know, I had to, even there's a part where I'm sort of beating Jackie all my sleep with Kali sticks. And, you know, they didn't want it to have any technique. They wanted me to almost look like the mad professor, you know, when I'm doing it. So, and, and, and I also realized very early in the game that to be in a movie like this with Jackie, you have to just throw caution to the wind. You have to re realize that you are more of a caricature than anything else. And if you didn't jump on board with that, you just didn't fit in that type of movie. So you just really had to have fun with it. I mean, look at the looks, you know, the eyes. Look at Jackie. He's like tears coming down. <laughs> Ugh, like this. And then he starts running, you know, and off we go. Yeah, so it's, it, it's, it's just a very interesting experience. But again, it, you know, a phenomenal experience, that's for sure. Yeah, crazy, crazy fight. Look at this. It's like... <laughs> It's funny memories. I'm just beating the daylights out of him. Well, here's your chance. Show me what you got. Mr. Nice Guy was a big uh, Jackie Chan film. So that was shot in Australia, was it? Yes, it was. Now look at that. Have a look at the outfit and the hair. 
I remember Samo deciding, he said, oh, you know, we slick your hair back and I'll give you a cigar. And I said, Samo, why can't I just be an ordinary looking bad guy? Why, why are you, <laughs> no, 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 we're gonna slick your hair back. And even the suit, you know, with the jacket, it's like this pinstripe suit. One day Jackie comes up to me and he looks at me and says, oh, horrible suit. I said, well, you're the producer on this. Do something about it. You know, it was, again, very funny. You're always a good actor, Richard. You would always put in a good performance. Very believable. It was great stuff. Thank you, mate. Yeah, well, it, again, it was, it was fun. And again, as I said, even in this, you have to just go along with the comedic sort of influence of the movie, you know, otherwise, because, you know, I would tend to want to downplay everything looks and you go, no, that's not going to work in this. You know, you just go for the ride, you know, and have fun. So who's hit you the hardest? Uh, definitely Samo. And was that Twinkle Twinkle, the sidekick or the punch? Well, the punch and also that, yeah, the sidekick where he drives me up against the wall. Yeah. He, as I said, again, he, he's actually very, very powerful. Like, you know, you know, this guy can really punch and really kick, yeah. you know, regardless of his physicality and, uh, well, and, and the other thing is there, they, it was all about contact. You know, what you saw happening in a way of contact was actually happening. Um, you know, you know, as you know, people like Tony Jaa sort of took a leaf out of the Hong Kong book that he's, he's renowned for making a lot of contact in his fights. And that was as a result of, of being influenced by people like Samo and Jackie and Yun Bill and that in Hong Kong. Well, I learned in Hong Kong, really, in Hong Kong movies, that my first experience of martial arts film was, was with those guys. And I think that did a lot of good for me, to be honest, because I immediately was working with the best people and immediately understood, oh, this is the way it's supposed to be shot. If you want it to look as good as what these guys are doing, well, then this is the way they do it. And this is how I should try and continue to do it. So I certainly took that influence when I went to the West and started doing American movies. But there was um, also, I have been accused of, of hitting a little bit too hard at times, but, you know, always try to be very safe and very respectful to the people that you're working with. And, and if I, I would never kick someone hard without asking permission to do it first, you know what I mean? But then, of course, some accidents do happen. But I think if you're going to, like, front kick someone to the body or side kick, you know, it's nice to get a bit of impact there. But of course, you know, you're going to have that conversation and say, put a pad on. Let's try and make, have this look impactful. And, you know, if I'm lucky enough to have an American stuntman allow me to kick him in the head, but I, I will take that opportunity because I personally think it looks fantastic. No, no question about that. And I, I'm, I'm the same with you. It just depends on who you happen to be working with. But yeah. I also, you know, I remember, you know, again, as I said, I took so many lessons back to me and I would go back and shoot a Western movie and it was like a walk in the park yeah. because you've got 10 or 12 hour days, you've got all these mod cons and everything else, which you never had in Hong Kong. So it really kind of hardened me up to the two different styles of filmmaking. Um, and I, I know for me, even today, if, if I'm going to do a fight scene, I, I really want contact. I want a kick coming at me where I know I can't just put my hand up that I've got to actually block properly or it's really going to hurt me. And I believe that brings out a better performance. It, yeah. You know, it, it makes it look a lot more real because you're actually anticipating a bit of power from the person you're fighting with as opposed to kind of doing a dance routine. But now this looks like a brutal bit of uh, a brutal day. He was a Thai fighter. He did compete professionally. And see this move right here. This is a move that I got from Benny Urquides, you know, where you go in, it's almost like a scarf hold in jiu-jitsu. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember I wanted to put that in there. And there was a couple, there was three or four guys, friends, you know, standing over there, uh, Filipinos, and they were kind of going, sort of laughing a little bit, you know. Um, and I said, oh, to the AD, I said, Sampol, what are they saying? He said, oh, no, nothing. Uh, no, come on, what are they saying? Oh, they said if you held him really like that, he would just spin and elbow you. And, of course, you and I are probably the same. I said, oh, really? Come here. And I grabbed one of them and hold it on really tight. He nearly passed out. And I finally let him go, and he walked away. I saw him walk away to the others, and he's going, oh. 
yeah, like this. <laughs> what I'm going to make believers out of them, you know? That explains the intensity of this fight sequence then, because it looks like you're properly hitting each other for some of it. Yeah, no, we were on that one. And he was great Correct. to work with. And, you know, it, again, it wasn't supposed to be flashy. It was just supposed to be kind of a bit ugly and rough and down and dirty. And uh, so that was a lot of fun working with him. What I loved about Kurosawa is like the element of character that was brought in. I thought Toshira Mufuni was just amazing on screen. And the fact that there was the attention, it, it, for me, that a lot of these fights weren't as much about the actual moves as, I often say that a fight scene is, about, is as much about what you're not doing as what you are doing. And the, the character and the look on Mifune's face when he's approaching his level of confidence and everything else, already, you know, when I watch this, I was drawn into this as a dramatic piece because fights, they're not just action, they're actually a continuation of drama. You know, and the little quirky things Mifune would do with his, his shoulder as, as this character, he had this little kind of thing, he'd lift his shoulder up and down and look at the confidence, see him just drop that right shoulder up and down. And he just starts moving, this guy's got a gun. I love that they used what would be a legitimate combat move to move side to side when somebody's shooting at you, not just run straight forward. And then just the sheer ferocity. And when he finishes, it's the way he just resheaths the, the katana, his sword, and just walks off. You watch here. He'll, he's, he's just fantastic. I think did Tarantino steal this bit when he had Uma Thurman say, go home to your mother. Yeah, and also, and also you know that uh, Fistful of Dollars, you know, this was uh, Sergio Leone did an, almost a copy of this movie in the Western form. And I love this fight because, again, this, this, is, this reminds me of the old Western gunfights where there was so much stillness. You, you notice here, there's a bit of dialogue. It's almost like the cowboys, you'd see the fingers twitch and you'd almost be on the edge of your seat waiting for one of them to make a draw. And this is the equivalent of that. So, again, it wasn't, it was almost all this tension is built up. You're waiting, waiting, waiting until suddenly... You know, our opponent here does a draw and Mifune just does this reverse draw and cuts him across the stomach and the blood spurts out. So the actual cut is almost anticlimactic. It's almost like you go, oh, thank God, because of the tension that Kurosawa would build up leading to the actual physical move. So you're almost holding your breath. And again, this is one wide shot. They haven't cut into this at all, which is also a fantastic part of it. It builds the tension, doesn't it? Doesn't it, though? And, and look at this, and bump, and suddenly it's all over. And it was almost just a magic thing where, you know, a bit of a cutaway to the reactions, which Kurosawa always did. There were fantastic reactions from bystanders. And there's almost a stillness after the cut. And I enjoyed this because in the end of it, these guys are more or less saying, oh, what a great job. And he gets really angry, you know, because he realizes he's killed a person and he's not happy about it at all. In other words, it's, it's just so many wonderful character elements come in that make it a dramatic scene, not just a fight scene. Yes, it, it works brilliantly. The tension builds, the, the shot holds. You don't need to edit this. I mean, sometimes, obviously, but if you can do it in one, it's always better. It's always better. You know what you realize? It's like, you know, and it's explained to me once, if you go to theater, it's like watching theater. If you go to theater and sit in live play, you only have a wide shot. Yeah. I mean, you can choose to focus your eyes on one aspect, but pretty much a wide shot. There's no dollying in or anything. So looking at that scene you just showed for me is like looking in live theater where it's just the people, you're not cutting away from everything, you're seeing everything in its entirety and it still works beautifully. Of course, they, they cut to a few reactions and everything else, but I just think it's an interesting uh, way of filmmaking. And I also feel that a lot of action is kind of getting back to that again. I think even Bruce in his early days, you know, you would often see Bruce in a wide shot. You'd see where the kick started from, where it landed, and you got to see the ballet, the poetry of somebody who was that good at what they do. And not blowing smoke, but you're capable of doing exactly the same thing with your technique 
that you can pull the camera back and it's just beautiful to see an entire kick, whether it's spinning kick, a round kick or whatever it is, it's your entirety. And for me, I just get to appreciate the sort of magnificence in that type of movement, you know, as opposed to shaky camera and going in tight all the time and leaving the audience almost confused as to what they're watching at. I always said that, you know, when I shot a lot of the films I did in the 80s, which, you know, God, God love them, you know, I wouldn't want to see them again, but you know, you used to have drama, 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 and then the drama would stop, you'd have a fight scene, and then the drama would continue. Well, that doesn't sort of work anymore. Now, the action needs to be a part of the storytelling, which is why it's often referred to as nonverbal dialogue, where you're just telling a story with the physicality. And again, I, I keep saying I, I love seeing the almost the thought process of the fighters or the actors playing whatever they're playing that goes along with whatever happens in their mind before they strike and particularly afterwards too. As you know, if you actually get hit in the head, you're going to have an emotional response. It might be, oh, that hurt. It might make you angry. It might make you fearful, but there's going to be an emotional response. And I think for the camera to capture that part of the interaction is a huge part of the storytelling. Well, Richard, thanks for spending some time doing this with me. You've given us many great things over the years and uh, really appreciate talking to you, mate. It's been great. Thank you, Scott. And I, you know, and I appreciate guys like you, as I said, and I mean that you just carrying the torch in the, in the most honorable way possible. I mean, the expertise of guys like you is just far and beyond what I was ever capable of. And that's a great thing because we're doing this, you know, everything's going in a good direction and, I, I'm just blown away with the expertise of some of the people out there. So I uh, would, couldn't be happier, you know, and I'm, I must say also that it's talking to you and br when you bring back memories of Hong Kong and everything like that, it's you, you tend to go, you know what? They were really good times. I remember talking to a stunt, you know, friend of mine in uh, on suicide squad uh, in Atlanta, Georgia. And, he he asked me about it and I could see his eyes just doing this. He was an amazingly good stunt guy. And he said, Rich, he said, you're part of history to work with Jackie Chan and Sammo Hong. And it's only then that you kind of go, wow, you know what? That is special, you know, because at the time it's just a job. You don't, you don't think in 20 years what that's going to mean mm. either in your career or the effect it's going to have on anybody else, even like yourself. And, you know, I think that that's fun when you get a reaction, you're able to tell stories and realize, you know what, it's been an amazing journey. The journey's still continuing on. And, you know, I just feel very, very fortunate. Yeah, you're one of the, the main white faces from, from Hong Kong movies. You know, you've, you've done so, so much of that stuff. And as I said, you know, I'm ripping you off, uh, stealing your lines. So you've inspired many of us, Richard, and you're still doing it today. So. I'm checking you, the mailbox for that residual check, Scott, that you said you mailed. But, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm telling you, it's in the post. <laughs> it's Australia. It takes a while. Probably could have COVID-19, right? It's got delayed. It's probably, on a, it's probably on a ship on the way over some great ocean. Maybe they've lost it. I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll pop another one. In the yeah. <laughs> but thank you, Scott. I really enjoyed talking with you, my friend. And I wish you, of course, all the very best because I know your career is far from over. And who knows, maybe I'll get to play an aging gangster in one of your movies. You're very welcome. I'd be happy to have you. Give me a good kick in, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give it a shot. But you're not allowed to kick me back, Scott. You've got to have respect for your elders. You know how that works. Yes, I'm very respectful. And I don't kick as hard as Samo. Anyway, you'll be fine. <laughs> I'm not sure about that. All right. Thank you, Scott, very much, mate. I, I, again, I really enjoyed it. Mm -hmm.